Dogs are great. I've got a corgi who begs for attention and chases my toddler around. And I've got a scraggly mutt who somehow receives compliments from strangers about how beautiful she is. And I'm like, look, we both know she looks like a fuzzy chupacabra, but she's still super cool. But today is not about those good doggos, as Reddit would like to call them. No, today is about those strange hybrid looking monsters known as dogmen. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to hear about my undying loyalty to pandas. Enjoy these scary and allegedly real dogman sightings, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org. Reply in the comments with natural landmark locations you'd like to hear stories from. For example, Rocky Mountains, National Forests, etc. And lastly, check out eeriecast.com for more free and scary podcasts like this. Now, let's begin. Warning, the following story contains depictions of harm against animals. The Pig Farm Werewolf From Benji B. The story I'm about to tell you happened when I was around 11 or 12 years old, so the year would have been 1999 or possibly 2000. I live in central Sweden. My parents had been divorced for many years, and the day of my encounter, my younger sister and I were visiting our dad at his farm. He raises slaughter pigs there for one of the country's biggest meat producers. I've always loved animals, and I enjoyed helping out at the farm feeding the animals and cuddling with the piglets. My dad had built the pig housing just a couple of years before. Now, when you entered through the main entrance, you would find yourself at the beginning of a long corridor, with four doors on the right side and two doors on the left, with one door at the end of the corridor leading out to the back side of the building. The first door on the right led to an office and staff room, and the second door led to a storage room. The following two doors on the right and the last door on the left led to the three what we called pig stables, called stable number one, two, and three, each with 48 separate pens where the pigs were housed. The first door on the left went to the barn where we stored food and straw for the animals. Now, the way this farm worked was that we received pregnant sows a week or two before they were expected to give birth, and when the piglets were old enough, the sows were sent to the other farms to rest for a few months before they were impregnated again. The piglets stayed with us until they were old enough to be sent off to slaughter. Now back to the story. The day of my encounter was a very cold winter day, probably around December or January. The ground was covered in a thick layer of snow, and the sky was clear. A perfect winter day, my sister and I had arrived at our dad's place around lunchtime the same day. That afternoon, we were in the stables, helping out with the chores. I remember that in stable number one, it held slaughter pigs that were maybe a couple of months old. In stable number two, we had pregnant sows expecting to give birth at any day. And stable number three was empty. At the time, it had just been cleaned and prepared for a new delivery of pregnant sows to arrive within a few days. I remember my sister being so bored that day. The only thing she liked to do was cuddle and play with the newborn piglets, of which we had none at the time. My dad was in the empty stable, number three, working on a broken gate to one of the pens, which had been damaged when the slaughter pigs that were housed there earlier were moved. I had just fed the pigs in stable two when my dad told me that he had found one of the slaughter pigs injured. Now, it was quite common for them to get injured when they're in the teenage stage of life, trying to establish dominance and being very eager and playful. But it was unusual for them to get any serious injuries. Usually, it was just smaller scratches and bite marks. When he told me that this pig probably had a broken front leg, my heart dropped because I knew that there was nothing we could do and the pig would have to be put down to end its misery. I hated that. It was not often it happened, but when it did, I always teared up. I helped my dad to find the injured pig, 
and we carried it out through the door to the backside of the building. Out on the backside, there was a big round manure tank, approximately 15 meters in diameter and several meters deep, partly buried in the ground with just about a meter of the top above ground level. We carried the pig to the other side of the tank, and my dad brought a butchery bolt gun, but I refused to stay out there while my dad did what he had to do. I went back inside, and I continued to feed the pigs, listening to music, trying to get my mind off of what happened to that poor pig. After a while, my dad came in to tell me he needed to go to his workshop to get some tools to fix the gate, and he asked if I wanted to stay here or come with him. His workshop was where he stored and maintained his agricultural machines and equipment. It was a 10-minute drive from the farm, and he said he would be back in half an hour. So I told him I would stay. I helped him carry some tools to his car, then watched him and my sister drive away. It was mid-afternoon by then, but it was already dark outside. Now I was alone on the farm, but I didn't mind that. We lived just south of the Arctic Circle, and in the winter we only have a few hours of sunlight from the late morning to early afternoon, so I was used to the short winter days and the darkness. At the moment the sky was still clear, but it was now covered with bright stars and the moon, which looked big and bright and more beautiful than usual. I went back inside to the staff room to eat one of the sandwiches my dad had brought for us. After that, I went back to start cleaning out the pens in stable one and two. These stables had slatted floors that could be opened to scrape down any dung and straw, which was then automatically transported out to the open manure tank on the backside. Because of the freezing temperature, I first had to go out on the back to start a circulation pump to keep the liquid manure from freezing in the pipes. I went out the back, opened the hatch to the control panel, and started the pump. I then closed the hatch, and I looked across the manure tank at the pig lying there in the snow. A dim light shone through the windows from the lights inside and from the moon lighting up the area. The snow under the pig's head was now colored red, and I actually felt a bit relieved that he was no longer in pain. I went back inside, starting to clean out the pins. After about half an hour, I'd finished the two stables. My dad and sister weren't back from the workshop yet, so I decided to go to the staff room to have a Coke from the refrigerator and watch some TV until they came back. We still had some work to do, but I felt I deserved a break. They'd probably be back any minute. After a few minutes of watching some boring reality show and drinking Coke and having my second sandwich, I remembered I left the circulation pump to the manure tank on out back. I put down my sandwich and went out to the corridor towards the back door to turn it off. I opened the back door, stepping out, and I was just about to open the hatch to the control panel when I saw something moving in the corner of my right eye just across the manure tank. I looked over towards it, and immediately my heart felt as if it stopped. My entire body froze from fear. What I saw was something I had never seen before, something I hope against hope that I'll never have to see again. Over on the other side of the manure tank, there was a huge animal leaning over the carcass of the pig we'd left out there earlier in the day. The animal faced away from me, so I could only see its back. At first, I thought it was a brown bear, but it was way bigger, and it had a tail with long hair on it, like the tail of a golden retriever. This animal was covered in dark gray and black fur, with a wide, muscular upper body, and I could see the steam from its breath rising in the cold air. Suddenly, the animal stood up on its hind legs. It really was huge. I would guess maybe 220 to 240 centimeters tall. It turned its head slightly to the right, nose towards the sky, and it opened its mouth to toss a piece of meat down its throat. 
The head was definitely the head of a wolf, but much bigger and darker. It had long furry ears pointing upwards and a long snout with big canine teeth. We have both wild wolves and bears living in this area, but this, oh, this was something else, something bigger, stronger, something that gave off an evil vibe. The animal leaned down over the pig carcass again, continuing to feast on its meal. I realized it hadn't yet noticed me standing there outside the door behind it. I was so scared, I didn't know if I should scream, cry, or faint. My body was still frozen and just wouldn't move. Finally, I found the strength to silently walk backwards inside and softly close and lock the door. Even when I was inside, I tried to run through the corridor as quietly as possible to lock the front door as well. I did not want to give that monster any chance to get inside. I walked over to the door to stable number two that had windows facing the back side where the creature had been. I looked into the stable through the window in the door. The windows in the wall were about two meters up from the floor. From there, I could only see the steam from its breath rising in the air outside. Suddenly, some of the pigs saw me through the door window and started to grunt loudly. Soon, all of them were grunting very loud, as they always do when they see a person at the door. They were excited, hoping I was bringing them more food. I looked back to the windows, just in time to see the creature stand up and turn towards the window, looking in the direction of the sound of the pigs. I could only see the top of its head and the ears when it walked up to the window. I quickly sat down on the floor in front of the door, and now, silently, I cried. I started to crawl on the floor back to the staff room to get to the phone and call my dad. Remember, this was around the year 2000, when a 12-year-old wouldn't have a mobile phone. I reached the door and realized that there are two big windows in the staff room, windows that didn't have any curtains or blinds. I didn't dare go inside, risking that the creature would turn up on the front side of the building and see me through the window. I sat down in the corner between the doors to the staff room and the front door. At that point, I could not hold it in anymore. I began to cry like never before. I was sure this monster would get inside, and if it did, it would hear me crying, and it would find me. Suddenly, the door handle on the front door violently turned, and something tried to push the door open. I screamed, and the handle turned again, followed by two loud thuds and an attempt to break the door open. I was sure then that I was going to die. When the door handle turned once more, I heard hard knocking on the door, followed by my dad's voice calling out for me. I rushed up, unlocking and opening the door, telling my dad and sister to hurry inside and to lock the door after they did. When I turned to my dad, he saw that I'd been crying, and he asked what was wrong. I told him the whole story of what I called the werewolf, and he looked at me, not saying a word, then looked at my sister. He looked back at me and asked if I am done feeding and cleaning the pins. I nodded. He nodded back, thoughtfully looking down at the floor for a few seconds, then back at us, telling us that the rest of the work can wait until tomorrow. Then he took us back home. In the evening, he went by himself to give the pigs their evening meal. My sister and I watched him from the upper floor of the house as he walked across the yard, hoping that the creature would not be hiding in the dark, ready to attack my dad. I remember him looking all around him with a flashlight as he walked. When he came back, I asked if he had seen the dead pig on the back side. He said he had, rather what was left of it. He said it looked as if some sort of predator had found it and dragged the rest of it into the forest. After that incident, my dad was very clear we were not allowed to go outside after dark. As I got older, I've been thinking a lot about that day and how my dad reacted after I told him what happened. 
followed by the new strict rules about never going outside after dark. Did he know this creature existed? Did he know that it lurked in the forests surrounding the farm? Had he seen it himself? My dad later passed away from leukemia some years later, before I had a chance to ask him about it. But I'm sure he knew something about the creature I saw that day. A dog man stared me down. From Colorado Rocky 1. This story happened on my grandparents' property, up in the Colorado mountains, a couple of hours outside of Denver. My grandparents lived in a decent-sized cabin in the smack-dab middle of the woods, and they have about 168 acres of forest. I was 19 at the time. I decided to go hunting since deer was in season, and I was honestly really excited to go hunting that year. It was around 9 a.m. After a breakfast of pancakes and eggs, I packed up a small backpack. I told my parents and grandparents I was going out for a while to see if I could bag a deer. They said okay, and I was on my way. Now, I'm 6 foot 4 and about 185. I would definitely not consider myself a small guy. Anyway, it took about 30 minutes for me to get to my tree stand. Along the way, I tried my best to be quiet. It was freezing outside. Must have been around 10 degrees. But the wind chill was way worse. I soon arrived at the stand and took the ladder up, and I sat there for a while. I was in a very good spot. I was high enough to see around me, and I was partially covered by leaves and branches. Here and there I made calls and noises, and after about two hours, I spotted three does running out of the trees and right into my shooting lane. I, unfortunately, was not going for does, but it was a bit of a morale boost because it meant that the deer were out and about around here. I really needed that, because I was freezing my butt off in that stand. After watching these does for a bit, they disappeared off in another direction, and I was alone again. I waited for about another hour to see if anything else would come up, but nothing did. I opened up my backpack and pulled out a couple of granola bars and some trail mix. It was lunchtime and I was starving. I finished my snacks and sipped on some water. In the middle of a drink, a big eight-point buck came trotting through the trees. To be honest, I nearly choked on my water. This was the biggest buck I've ever seen. It was right in my line of sight, and it was broadside, which was perfect. It was about 50-ish yards out, and my heart was pounding. I was so excited, I carried my personal 308 Winchester, which my dad bought me the year before when I turned 18. I steadied my aim, took a deep breath, and as I looked through and adjusted the scope, I saw the darn thing kick into gear and sprint away into the trees. Dang it, I muttered. I was genuinely pretty teed off by then. What the heck had scared it off, I wondered. I looked around with the scope, glancing to my left, and that's when I saw it, about 30 feet to the left of where the deer had been. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There was a set of big amber eyes staring right into my soul through the scope. Whatever it was, it had somehow seen me from this distance in my stand. My gut dropped as I saw this creature slowly emerge from the forest, coming right into my view. It stood on two legs. It was jet black, and the head reminded me of a German shepherd. Its ears were pointed, and it was very, very big. If I had to guess, it seemed to be standing at about eight feet tall. This thing was so well-toned, not like a bodybuilder, but more like a professional track runner. Its legs were skinny and dog-like. Its arms were lanky, ending in claws. Then I saw its lips curl back as it showed its teeth to me. It was snarling at me. I wanted to leave, I wanted to escape from there, but I couldn't stop staring at it. I was fixated on it, 
and it was fixated on me. I was freezing cold, and now my blood felt like ice coursing through my veins. I trembled, thoughts running through my mind as I realized my 308 Winchester was probably not going to do me any good against this thing which could probably shred me to bits. As if my mind and soul weren't shattered enough, this thing began to slowly walk toward my stand. It got about 25 feet away from me and just stared. Words cannot describe the fear and terror I felt. It gave me this look of, you're lucky you didn't shoot that deer, otherwise you'd be next. The beast then growled this really low, grumbly, loud growl. The best I can describe it was like an alligator bellow, but longer, but not as throaty and more dog-like. I was sweating so bad, my heart pounding out of my chest. Then it gave a sort of snort and turned around. In a swift motion, it got on all fours and ran in the direction of the buck. I sat there for a good half hour, watching and waiting, because there was no way you were going to get me out of that stand after watching it run off, not until I was sure it was long gone. Eventually, I finally gathered the courage and sprinted home so fast. I told my parents, but they didn't believe me. My grandparents, on the other hand, pulled me aside afterwards and said they'd seen something like it too. It's been a couple years though, but they've seen it, and they know it's out there. I've been back several times, and I've never seen it again, but luckily I don't want to. I think myself insanely lucky. Lucky that that creature was hungry for deer, and not me. A brief warning to those out in the woods. There are some things out there that can't be tamed, so be alert and be careful. My friend saw a dogman in his backyard. From Sneeve 0426. It was back sometime in 2019, late in the year. One of my friends, Ted, saw something in the middle of the night. Tired and feeling fatigued, Ted woke up, rolling out of bed. He headed to the bathroom and then to the kitchen for a late night snack. Whilst indulging in his snack, he began walking around his living room until he made his way to the window at the back of the house. It was on the second floor by the kitchen. While staring outside, a sudden figure in his backyard caught his attention. Now, the yard was huge, nothing really in it though besides a couple of trees, one of which had since rotted and fallen down. He noticed a bit past one of those trees, a figure with glowing red eyes, a large snout, and it stood at about seven feet tall. The creature reared up on its legs, and he saw that it had jet black fur and was very muscular. It had these large perked ears too, similar to a German shepherd or perhaps a wolf, but creepier yet, it appeared to have antlers as well. But he says maybe that was just part of its ears, he couldn't really be sure because it was very dark. The creature sniffed the air, then suddenly looked directly at him. As his eyes met the gaze of this beast, he noticed that the eyes were a shade of blood red, the same color mentioned before. He couldn't believe what he was looking at. He knew what he was seeing was the real deal. He could see its breath in the cold night air. As the creature grunted and bared its teeth, it also began to growl. Now, this growl did not sound like a normal animal, but a deep, primal, guttural growl, nothing like he'd ever heard before. The creature took one last glare at him and ran off, jumping over the fence with ease. Shortly afterwards, Ted returned to his room, lying in bed wondering what he really saw. He found it hard to fall back to sleep, but eventually he did. To this day, he still wonders if he'll ever see that creature again. This encounter was not far away from where I live, but it's absolutely horrifying to think about. After all, we do live in the suburbs.
New Dogman Encounter, 2023 From C. Philly 100 A girlfriend of mine reached out to me with this story, which I found of particular interest, and you'll soon see why. This happened along the Deschutes River Trail outside of Bend, Oregon. She was running along the trail when she heard something behind her. When she turned around, she thought she saw what looked to be a black wolf quickly approaching her from behind. Without thinking, she found the nearest tree and started to climb up. She got about halfway up when this wolf reached the bottom of the tree. To her horror, she saw another one approaching from the opposite direction. The first wolf began to climb the tree, which is also when she realized its paws looked wrong. They looked more like the hands of a raccoon than wolf paws. She broke off a branch and began to swat at the wolf-like creature. It hopped down, and the other one began climbing up towards her perch in the tree. Again, she swatted the branch, and the other one jumped down too. She said the two of them looked up at her, their eyes reminding her of a German shepherd's eyes, almost a bright orange color and rather intense. They appeared to be studying her. The first one started climbing up again, and that's when she began to pray. She honestly felt those were about to be her last moments on earth. At that very moment, a deer ran by about 40 yards or so off to the right, away from the river, evidently trying to vacate the area. These wolf creatures saw the deer and immediately took off after it, running rapidly on all fours. She waited a couple of minutes until she was sure they were gone. Then, quickly, she shuffled down the tree and ran back in the direction where she came from, away from those wolves. When I asked her how big they were, she said they were about the size of German Shepherds, but very dark in color, with these odd-looking paws that weren't quite paws, but not like human hands either. When I pressed her on this, she was reluctant to explain further, as the retelling itself was understandably rather emotional for her. I then told her about dogmen, and asked her if she thought they might be a young dog person. She really couldn't say. She'd never seen a fully grown dog man to compare it to. She did say that they looked healthy. Big bushy tails, thick black fur, not to mention those bright orange eyes. Another thing that struck me as odd is that wolves almost never attack people, and they certainly don't climb trees. It sounded like their hands, for lack of a better term, allowed them to climb up toward where she was sitting in the tree. It also sounded like they weren't really trying to hurt her, but were more so engaging in a sport of sorts, much like young canines chasing a squirrel or something up a tree. There also seemed to be an extra element of intelligence, as it sounds like they'd flanked her position initially. I mentioned that she might want to talk to Vic Kundif, or someone that has more experience talking to people about these kinds of things. So far, she's been too upset and too scared to really tell people about it. So she's been telling people that some wolves chased her down the trail and that she'd escaped by climbing a tree, completely leaving out the part about them climbing up at her. And I assured her that these types of encounters actually did happen. And more often than not, they typically ended relatively well. And that these cryptids, while territorial, don't seem particularly violent towards humans. Though we certainly can't rule that out, as a possibility. The Werewolf of Fresno from Eros It was around 3 a.m. that night. My sister, my friend, and I were heading down Southern California to visit my sister in Orange County. My friend sat on the passenger side, my sister in the back seat. We stopped at a gas station in Fresno before heading out. After leaving this gas station, we started our way down Southern California. But it didn't take long for us to have to stop on our trip. I hadn't even left the town yet. I was driving and right before I passed the railroad tracks, something caught my eye. I turned to look at it 
and I busted a U-turn, driving back to see what was there. I turned into the block and locked the doors, rolling down a window just a bit. All I could really hear was the sound of all the dogs in the neighborhood barking. It seemed like all the dogs out there were going crazy. My sister yelled from the back seat, What are you doing? Why'd you turn around? Shh, I'm listening, I replied. What's going on? I then turned the car around and drove off. My sister then said, What was that all about? I thought I saw something. It looked kind of like a dog, but not. You must be freaking joking. No, I'm serious. I saw something and it didn't look right. While I'm explaining this to my sister, my friend who was on the passenger side turned to me with his hand on his chest, saying, Jesus, I thought I was the only one that saw that. I then asked, What did you see? Well, I saw the same thing. Something that didn't look like a dog exactly. Wait, did what you see have legs like a person, was on all fours, and from the waist up looked like a wolf? Yeah, that's exactly what I saw. I told this story many times to people I trust and know. They say it's fake, but I know what I saw that night. The Beast in the Snow From Curtis S. Location, Northwest Arkansas, Ozark Mountains This story begins like a lot of others. It's a tale of me and my high school buddies. For privacy reasons, we'll use their gamer tags from back then. The actual location of this tale will not be given. It happened back in late 2006, early 2007, when one of the largest snowstorms hit northwest Arkansas. We had 32 inches of snow and 5 inches of ice bearing down on us. There were over 85 fatalities from the storm alone, and over 500,000 people without power. It was very cold and very wet, but as many teenage boys do, we got bored and we all got together deciding to go check around to see if we could help people stuck in the snow. We checked on everyone's families that we knew to see if there was anything we could do to help. After some time of this and helping a few people out of the ditches, we again got bored and decided to go and check on G. Dilly's father, as their house was not in the greatest shape. His dad was kind of a lonely hermit. We sat down and talked with him for a while. He would kind of remind you of Deckard Cain from the Diablo games. It was always a sit down and stay a while kind of thing. It was never a fast visit for us boys. However, after a few hours of talking, dark started to set in. The temperature started dropping even more, and as I said earlier, most people were without power. It was very dark. The town looked like something out of an apocalyptic movie, all but abandoned. We tried to get out of the driveway to no avail. After 30 to 45 minutes of trying, we decided that it was best we stay there for the night. I called home to tell my family we were staying there. As the night went on, we started to go stir-crazy, just sitting around and doing nothing. So Timbo and I decided to go outside for a smoke, as Advent and G. Dilly stayed inside. As we smoked, we talked the other two into going down to a place where we all hunted and camped. Now, mind you, we all grew up around here. Timbo and I had the most outdoors experience. We were very avid hunters and fishermen. We loved to go camping. Advent and G. Dilly, however, were more of the inside gamer type. But they still knew their way around the woods. We grabbed our rifles and a shotgun from the truck, and we headed off. We passed one of our many camping spots we used that was on G. Dilly's land. As we walked into the dark and cold through the very thick woods past G. Dilly's house, things started to feel off to us. It felt like we were being watched. The whole you're now the prey feeling starting to set in. We chalked it up to the bitter cold. We continued farther into the woods. 
Looking back on it now, we probably should have turned around, not knowing what dangers awaited us in those woods that night. As we passed our old, most used campsite, we started to get into uncharted territory. That was the goal, though, to test ourselves against Mother Nature. We kept pushing on through the snow and roaring, freezing winds. We went into the pitch-black darkness. As we walked, out of nowhere, we heard the sound of a breaking branch. We spun around to nothing but darkness and a low, guttural growl. The sound made the hair on our necks stand straight up, and we felt it in our very cores. This was no longer an adventure, but survival. We quickened our pace, but to no avail, we ended up falling down a steep, deep gorge. We tumbled all the way to the very bottom of the gorge. Must have been around 40 feet. After that, we picked ourselves up, collecting ourselves and our belongings. We looked up then, and we saw something moving around at the top of the hill above us. It was a big, dark figure moving from tree to tree. As it moved around, we noticed that sometimes it moved on four legs, and at other times it only moved on two. We all decided that we were now at a disadvantage to whatever figure was above us on the top of the hill. At that point, with all of us being cold, tired, and hurting from the fall, we decided to find somewhere to set up camp. We walked a little ways down the gorge and found a riverbed. We decided to set up camp there. There was a four-foot drop there. We laid fallen trees over the top of the riverbed. We then gathered up evergreens and snow and put that on top of the fallen trees. We placed our fire a couple of feet outside of our shelter in the riverbed. We thought that if we built a fire, it may help to scare away whatever figure it was we'd seen, and we probably stood a better chance with the light from the fire. We then sat around the fire for a while. We thought everything had calmed down then. Timbo and I sat inside the shelter. Advent and G. Dilly sat on opposite sides of the riverbed by the shelter. We were all still on edge from what we saw. We talked about it all. At one point, I got up to relieve myself. Timbo decided to get up and add more wood to the fire. I had my back turned away from all of them. Suddenly, Timbo was startled by a possum, which had jumped over the woodpile. He shot at it and killed it. As the gunshot rang out, it startled the rest of us. After we realized what happened, we started cracking jokes at Timbo, calling him the Great White Hunter and Possum Slayer. Then we saw it. It was watching us from the distance. Our laughter quickly faded away to fear, the boys noticing me staring off behind them. They turned around to face the creature. We were face to face with its big red eyes. The thing crouched down by a tree, still easily five feet tall. It had a large body and a long canine-like face. It had huge, long, razor-sharp teeth too. At that very moment, it seemed like time stood still. Seconds felt like hours. Total fear hit us all. This creature stood up, fully towering over us. It was well over seven feet tall. I shouldered my rifle as a roar that seemed to shake the earth filled the air. I fired my 303, hitting it in the chest. Timbo's 30 30 hit its center mass. There was no way this creature could have survived this. As the air settled and cleared, we thought we were about to see this thing lying on the ground, but there was nothing but some deep red stains on the ground and tracks leading away from us. We followed those tracks into the darkness, adrenaline coursing through our veins. We chased it, not sure if it was from fear or shock. The idea of it going after someone else or one of us when we weren't prepared made me paranoid. To this very day, I don't know what made us go after it for sure, but we did. We went through hills and gorges, following these tracks and red stains. I figured at any moment the monster was going to come lunging out at us. As we pushed through the bone-chilling cold, we soon realized we were making one big circle. So did that mean it was circling back to us? 
we really had only one choice. We knew we were never going to catch this thing in this terrain, and there was no open ground for miles, and if it was coming back for us, our best option was to dig in and prepare to fight. We put our backs together, eyes in every direction, using the snow and trees for cover. We waited and waited, listening for any sound, looking for any sign of movement, but it never came. We stayed quiet as much as we all wanted to talk. Right before the morning sun shone in the sky, we did suddenly hear one long high-pitched howl, which seemed close, like it was just around the next bend. It was like it was telling us we might have won that skirmish, but the battle had yet to come. Maybe it was just the sound of defeat. We'll never really know. As the sound faded off into the mountains, we all sat there in disbelief until the sun was fully in the sky. Then we stumbled onto an old road and made our way back to G. Dilly's house. We were still not fully believing what happened that night. Everyone made a full recovery from the fall, but we never did really get over what we saw. On occasion, we do talk about it together. But this will be the first time any of us have shared the story to the outside world. We often wonder whatever happened to the creature. Where did it go? Were we the only ones out there to see it? Why didn't it finish its hunt? We may never know. Might have to get the boys back together at some point, go back down there someday and see what happens. I honestly think the only reason we're still alive has nothing to do with skill or being brave. I feel like it was pure luck. I look at the woods in a different light, and I watch and listen to everything. I've taught my kids to always expect the unexpected, and just because it's not in our history books doesn't mean it's not out there, or it doesn't exist. I know what I saw, and my friends know what they saw. My warning to you is to be careful in the forest. Always pay attention. Never get complacent, even if it's the woods you know like the back of your hand. It doesn't hurt to always be prepared for anything. I almost didn't make it out. From Pleasant Peasant It was late, about 9.30pm. I'm part of a school soccer team. At that night, we were playing in the outskirts of a poorer area near New Brownfels, Texas. We had just flattened the other team 4-0. to zero. In my excitement, I decided that I was going to get some celebratory Whataburger. I called a location nearby, ordered, and hung up the phone. I started to drive there. The road leading to the Whataburger contained some of the most sketchy-looking houses I'd ever seen. One of these houses was backed up to the soccer field, and just a few hours earlier, I joked to my friends that that house was definitely haunted. I wish I'd taken a picture. The place was terrifying. As I passed the house, something that looked like a person sprinted out of the woods on the other side of the road. I was so startled, it caused me to swerve, but I still hit the dude. I was so scared that I just seriously injured someone. All my red flags were going off. I jumped out of my car and ran to where the guy lay in the road, but he was already getting up. As I stepped closer, I realized what I hit was not a person. No, this thing, whatever it was, was about seven feet tall and looked as if it had already gotten into a severe accident before me. I could see its arm pop back into place with a loud snap from where it had landed all wrong. I muttered, what the heck, under my breath. Then I heard it, what the heck. It repeated what I said back to me in a strange voice that sounded almost like my own. As it turned around, it gave me this smile. The only thing I wanted to do then was run. And luckily, it didn't look like this thing could run very well at the moment, with its legs all twisted. As I turned to get away, I heard more snapping bones, and I saw something jump over me, landing on the roof of my car. I changed directions to my left, sprinting towards that creepy house I mentioned earlier. The windows appeared to be boarded up, but there was a light on inside. 
I figured that if someone was in there, they may have a gun or something. I had practically busted the door down with my shoulder, which was surprising because I'm only 5'8 and can't bench more than 140 pounds. The door must have been old and weak. As I stepped into the entryway, screaming for help, I noticed how empty, smelly, and dirty it was. In the living room to my right was a giant mess of hair, old blankets, and destroyed cardboard boxes. Oh God, I just walked into its lair, I thought. I looked to my left. There were random bones scattered about that I prayed were just animal bones. I wiped my mouth and continued running upstairs. Just as I turned into the upstairs hall, I heard something screech, banging on the outside walls. Before long, I could hear it coming up the stairs. Grabbing an old metal chair, I banged it against a window, breaking the glass, just as I heard the sound of footsteps rapidly approaching me. I pulled myself out of the window, and as I dropped to the ground, something clawed against my forearm, just below my elbow. I hit the ground then, sprinting for my car, with the door still open and the key still inside. I jumped in, closing the door and hitting the gas. I was out of there. A few minutes of driving later, my arm began to sting. I pulled into the parking lot of the Whataburger. I looked at my arm and noticed how much blood was there. I covered it with my sweatshirt so my mom wouldn't freak out, and I hurried home. I ate my dinner in my room, and after I showered, I cleaned everything up. It did end up scarring. All in all, I was lucky. If that door hadn't opened, if the glass window hadn't broke, if I was a half second slower, I could have died. Nowadays, I only ride home from soccer on the bus with the freshman out of fear of seeing it again. It ran after us. From Mary Had a Little Lamb. This happened exactly two years ago. My grandma had broken her leg, fractured her femur in two places more specifically, and got surgery a few days later. She was sent home and was bedridden for about three months. At the time, she was prescribed injectable treatment, and we would drive there every day so I could give her the injection. My dad worked until late in the evening, so we'd always get there between 7 and 9 p.m., and we'd leave around 11 p.m. It was a lovely winter night back then. The electricity poles and some houses were decorated with Christmas lights and the air smelled like holiday. The sky was so clear, you could read all the constellations above you. We live in the Romanian countryside, our house and my grandma's house on opposite sides of a forest. I grew up there, so I never found the forest scary. Ever since I was around seven years old, I would spend most of my days there. I picked mushrooms in the spring, gathered herbs and flowers in the summer, looked for chestnuts in the autumn, and made snowmen in the winter. I always carried around a wooden bow and arrows, handmade by my grandpa. All the rangers knew me, they gave me sweets, offered to take me home in their car, and gave me advice on how to act in case I came face to face with a wolf or a bear. One of them taught me how to hunt rabbits. I let them go though after I cuddled them, and they even drew me a target on a piece of cardboard so I could practice my shots. The forest was always kind to me. The real evil was in the village. That December night sealed it. My mom wanted to come with us to cook something fresh for grandma and clean the house. We ended up finishing everything very late, so we got in the car, waited for it to warm up, then left. I remember checking the car watch and thermometer. 1.24 a.m., negative 11 degrees Celsius. My dad was telling a story about a guy at work forgetting the water on in the director's bathroom, then trying to vacuum it away. He electrocuted both himself and the director. My mother made a bad Romanian pun, and we were all laughing. The streetlights on this side of the village were off. It happened sometimes since they would randomly pick areas and turn them off to save energy. I was looking outside the window at the houses. The one I set my eyes on was vacant. 
The elderly couple there had died, and all the children were living abroad now. That's a very common thing here. Now, because we were on top of a hill, my dad slowed down to change gears, so I got to see it bottom to top. On its roof was a big white form. At first, I thought it was the chimney covered in snow, but then I saw its glowing eyes from its profile. It rose up on two legs. It had the head of a wolf with beautiful blue eyes and a big snout ending with a wet nose and its feet were curved the way a dog's would be, but they ended with big human feet, not paws. My first thought was, wow, that's a pretty animal. Surrounded by the sparkling snow with its fur reflecting the moonlight, it was actually gorgeous. My fantasy was shattered when it bared its teeth at me and slid down from the roof in the middle of the road, now slowly walking behind our car. My parents were busy talking about something mundane. I was staring at it through the rearview mirror, color draining from my face slowly, my nails white as I was gripping my sleeve. I'm not a religious person, but at that very moment, I was praying, please don't let it get us, please not now, not with my parents, please make it go away. My dad happened to check the mirror on his side, and his expression went blank. Then his head shot towards me. Stop looking at it, he said calmly, and reached back to lock the door on my mom's side, then his. I did the same. First the one in the back, second the one on my side. My father was catching more and more speed. That thing was definitely after us, getting closer and closer until we heard a loud thump above us. Suddenly, it landed in front of our car. My mother's eyes went up from her phone and she screamed. Careful, dog! My dad turned on the long range lights and evaded it then sped up as much as the car could take. I was still praying, please don't let it follow us, please. My whole body trembled while I checked if it was still behind us. It wasn't. It remained in that spot until we took a turn and disappeared in the darkness. Our house is almost 10 kilometers away from where we encountered it. I looked around to see if it was safe to get out. Then I got out to open the gates. As my dad was pulling into the driveway, my dog jumped on me, licking my fingers and covering my jacket in snow. I was locking up everything for the night. I looked up at the hill in front of our house then. There it was, at the base of the forest, fur wider than the snow, eyes glowing in curiosity. It was looking at me. I felt like it was, at least. It turned around and left for the tree line. It knows where we live, but it never visited. I don't know if I should be happy or sad. My parents hope to never see it again. As for myself, a glance would be enough. After all, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I'm rushing to write this. I'm going to visit my grandmother again soon, and I drive by myself now. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.